Good day, folks, and welcome back to the channel. To me, it's one of the coolest Super Bowl rings there ever was. It's 14 karat white gold. I think there's 143 diamonds, and they use sapphire and rubies for the logo. I don't want to sell it because what happens is, is someone will come in from, say, Boston and say, hey, he's got a Super Bowl ring in the showcase. He'll go home, tell his friends, they'll want to come in the pawn shop and see it. One of these days, I'm gonna sell that thing when he's not around. Today, we'll show you the biggest gold deals on Pawn Stars. Eight is a denomination, biggest gold coin the Spanish made. From everything I can see on this one, it's absolutely genuine. Okay, so what do you think this is worth? I would put a price tag of 18,000 on it. Okay. California Gold Rush Scale. In this episode, a customer named Chris brought in an old scale and some gold from the California Gold Rush. Chris thought the scale was worth $1,500 because of its history, but Rick disagreed, saying it wasn't worth much because of its condition. Hey, how's it going? What can I help you with? I have a really cool antique from the gold rush here. It's a scale that dates back to the 1800s. Okay, is there any gold in there? <laughs> Actually, there is. There is? Yep. Okay. That looks like a little bit of plaster gold right there, yeah. It's great how, like, uh, when gold's raw like this, it really doesn't look like gold. It looks right. like ugly, dirty brass, but that's the way gold looks. <laughs> I actually got it from a friend who was clearing out an estate in Minnesota. It's really cool because the vial of gold has never been opened. I think it's worth around 1500 because of the antique historical value of the piece. As cool as the gold is, I'd just rather have folding money. And you have a scale. I do. You would tie the two pans to it, put whatever you're weighing in one side and your little counterweights in the other until it balanced straight up and down. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you just drop them on a scale and it's done. Right. Now, as far as your scale here, Really, really interesting, but is basically worthless. The problem is the common as dirt. It's no different than a beat up rusty lantern from the 1850s. Okay. He offered $400 for the gold, considering its weight and purity. Chris was surprised by the low offer, thinking the gold's history made it more valuable. The gold, on the other hand, is always worth money, always will be. <laughs> Do you have an idea how much is in here? I think it's about 10 grams. Yeah, for this stuff, I would pay you $40 a gram. So if there's 10 grams, there would be 400 bucks. Mm -hmm. And that would be it. You can't do any better just because it's, uh, no, just as, as a package, I think it has a lot more historical value. I want $1,500. Okay, no. <laughs> Rick explained the goal's value stays the same over time and he wouldn't pay more for it. Even though Chris was disappointed, Rick stuck to his offer, saying he preferred gold and silver in the shop. In the end, they didn't make a deal, and Chris left without selling anything. It's neat. It's cute. Yeah. Basically, what you have here is you have some scrap gold. There's no difference that it's in a plaster gold, it's mined gold, it's from 1850 gold. Gold is gold. 400 bucks, that's what I could do. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I could sell it for that. Okay. Well, thanks for coming in, man. Yep. Thanks. William Tolliday Goldsmith Piece Brandon brought out a special goldsmith piece by William Tolliday, a renowned sculptor. He hoped to get $8,000 for it, appreciating its detailed work. The piece had a family connection, passed down from Brandon's grandparents who helped Aaron spill and kickstart his career. Hey, how can I help you? How's it going? I just want to see you might be interested in this. William Tolliday, that has been a long time since so I've seen anything done by him. Yeah, they're pretty rare. He was a gold sculptor. Okay, which is a really, really weird profession and a really weird art form. This is literally sheets of gold and some guy there with a little hammer. It is a massive pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get 8,000 uh, for the goldsmith piece itself. I really would like to have someone else maybe enjoy it who can enjoy the craftsmanship that goes into something like that. This is really cool. Where did you get it? Well, I was it inherited to me from my grandparents. The story that they gave me was that this was given to them by Aaron Spelling um, as a kind of a thank you for getting him started in the business. They were actually gave him his first job. So your grandparents helped Aaron Spelling actually start in the entertainment business? Absolutely, yeah. Rick liked its history and craftsmanship, but initially offered only a thousand. After some negotiation, Rick settled on $1,600, understanding its sentimental value. He felt it was a fair price considering its rarity and family story. How much did you want for it? I haven't seen anything like it before, so I would say a fair value would be about eight grand. That's what I think. Um, people who collect William Holiday want a castle. I'd give you like a thousand bucks for it. Is there any way that you could do 2,200? It would make us both happy. Um, it would make you happy, it would not make me happy, and I would go 15, that would be it. 
I'd like to go for a 17, but that's that's probably all I'd be able to do because it's a family thing and the story behind it and it's pretty I'll, rad, I'll so. tell you what, I'll go 1600 bucks. It is a very interesting piece. Yeah. But I'm going to sit on it for a long time. So if you can do 16, I'll do it. I'm, I'm just not going to go anymore. I can't. Yeah, I'll take 16. Yeah. So sweet. Right. Cool. Brandon planned to use the money for his wife's Jeep and perhaps some upgrades for his truck. It was a satisfying deal for both parties. I'm accepting the $1,600 offer because I do believe it's fair. So I think I'm going to buy some stuff for my wife's Jeep. And with some of it left over, I might throw some stuff on my truck too. We'll see. Gold bar. In a special episode, a guy named Matt came to the shop with a mysterious gold bar. Rick and Corey carefully checked it and figured it was worth around $2,400. What we got here? Uh, I got a gold bar I want you to look at. Right. Where in the world did you get this? Grandma just passed away a few months ago. We were cleaning things out, and uh, we found this thing. It's a big chunk of gold. You got approximately $24,000 worth of gold here? Wow. The bar had strange markings and crusty stuff on it, making Rick think that it might be linked to a sunken ship. The weird thing about it is the markings on it right here. What the XX means, I have no idea. So what's the deal with this white stuff on there? Sometimes they cast this in a mold that's called investment. It's like plaster of Paris, but different. And this feels like it's actually like coral or something. I mean, it looks like shipwreck stuff, to tell you the truth. You mean like buried treasure? It could be, yeah. This thing might not be worth its weight in gold. It might be worth way more. Um, I would like someone to take a look at it. This could be off a ship just because of this right here. So I'll find out if it's treasure for you. That'd be great. Okay, okay. thanks. They asked a marine artifact expert who said the markings were from the 1500s, hinting that it was from a shipwreck, making it more valuable. Well, what are your concerns, Rick? What the XX means, I have no idea. And it looks like there's some crustacean on the back of it that's not from casting. Well, what you've got here are the finest markings. These particular stamps I recognize from the 1500s. And even at that time, gold was evaluated on a 24 scale. It's marked as 20 carat. I could see with my own two eyes that that's more gold than 20 carat. Well, they had taxes in the 1540s and 1550s also. <laughs> so if you can get it marked for less, you can avoid some of those taxes. So you think it's off a ship? Well, what you have is definitely coral incrustation. Coral will attach itself to something harder to grow. Okay. That would have taken, um, oh, decades to have attached itself. This thing was underwater for a long time. And um, this is definitely shipwreck treasure. Okay. Sweet. <laughs> After some talk, Rick offered $3,500, which Matt happily took. This sale marked the exciting and successful deal of the mysterious gold bar with a maritime history. So how much do you think it's worth? Mill times two is what you're talking about. Okay. You got what does that mean? Remember earlier when I said $24,000 in scrap? Yeah. Scrap is melt. It's just like a trade term. So you're telling me that's worth $48,000? In that neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. You can almost start melting down wedding bands and <laughs> stamping X's on it. If you can get the coral to grow on it, I got a fish tank. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming in, Mel. My pleasure. And how much would you like for it? Well, if it's worth 48, I want 48. Um, I'll give you $35,000, and I don't even want to pay you that. All right. 35,000. Let's go do some paperwork. Totally pumped to get $35,000. It was a lot more than I expected, so I'm pleased as punch to get that. Egyptian scarab ring. Hillary, the customer, arrived with an Egyptian scarab ring inherited from her father, dating back to the 18th dynasty. Rick, intrigued, sought expert opinion to verify its authenticity. I have here an Egyptian scarab ring. It was given to me by my father a couple of years before he passed away, and I'd like to know if this is the real thing or not. All right. So was your dad like Indiana Jones or something like that? Not, not <laughs> in the least. <laughs> oh, that is the card from the guy that sold it over in Egypt, and he wrote on the back that it's guaranteed that it's from the 18th dynasty, uh, 1500 BC. Okay. So I'm assuming you want to sell it? Yes, I do. And how much would that be for? I would like uh, 15000 for it. OK. Do you mind if I have someone look at it? No, that oh. would be great. Okay. I'd really like that. Dr. Phineas Castle confirmed its age and significance as a symbol of eternal life in ancient Egypt. However, the gold work hinted at a more recent creation, 
likely early 1900s. Um, this beetle was a dung beetle. As these dung beetles would roll this big ball of dung that they would deposit their eggs in, that one will die. A new beetle would come from that ball and then turn around and start pushing the ball. And so for the Egyptians, when they looked at that, they said, well, look, that thing's magical. It's got eternal life. And consequently, it became a very magical bug to them. That is neat. Right there is a sun, a rake, and a scarab. Underneath it, an ibis. And that says to me, 18th dynasty. And King Tut came from this dynasty. Usually one of these went in almost every mummy. So, and there were a lot of people that died in all those thousands of years, so there are quite a few of these in Egypt, is what I'm trying to say. Now, the second thing you have to look at with this, that when I study the gold work on this, can you see the rope work on there? That sort of gold work is very indicative of like turn of the century, 1900 to maybe like 1905, 1910. It could have been made in Egypt, and a lot of those antiques uh, went on with the King Tut exhibit to be souvenirs. So this is probably a real scarab, though. I think that is a real scarab, and from the look of it, it looks 3,000 years old. Despite its historical value, the appraisal worth shocked both Rick and Hillary. Only $450 to $500 much lower than the initial $15,000 expectation. Okay, so what do you think it's worth? Well, you can get a scarab like that, I'm gonna say right now, for maybe $250. So $250 plus mm -hmm. like $200 in gold? So you're looking at right around $450 to $500. Eventually, Rick offered $360, which Hillary accepted, planning a celebratory dinner. The appraisal highlighted the gap between sentimental value and market price for ancient artifacts. I would give you right around $350 for it. Um, $1,500? No, it makes no economic sense for me to do this. I can literally make these for $450. $500. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being really, really nice at $350. I really am. $375? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I will give you 360 bucks. All right, I'll take it. We got a deal then. We got right. a deal. Follow me right up front. I think I'm gonna take the $360. My husband and I can go out and have a really nice steak dinner and lobster too. Viking treasure. When a seller presented what he claimed to be a collection of Viking artifacts, Rick promptly summoned Laird, an expert in Viking relics, for an assessment. After careful examination, Laird discerned that while some pieces hail from Baltic Viking tribes, others didn't belong to Vikings themselves. Hey, how's it going? Rick, how are you? A guy came in with a collection of stuff that he says are Viking origin. I'm really hoping they're legit, because items from Vikings and the men of the north are really hard to come by. So I called my friend Laird to help me out with this collection. This is my Viking friend. There you go. <laughs> nice to meet you. I, I, I guess before I, I proceed, did this all come as part of one collection? Yeah, it was all together, all one. If we look at uh, what I'd say is, is this group of items right here, this is diagnostically Baltic Viking. Baltic Viking, is that not Viking? <laughs> well, I think it's, the academics would say technically it's, it's not Viking. These are tribes that were not necessarily as migratory as the Vikings or as warlike. They were contiguous with the Viking areas and they traded quite a bit with them and they copied um, their style of garb, their style of decorations. If you or I were put back in time and we walked in on these people, they would have looked like Vikings to us. Okay. Unfortunately, you see a lot of these types of items on, on auction sites right now. Because of that, the value is very low to negligible on these items. Among the finds were a copper alloy bracelet, valued between $175 to $200, and an arrowhead of uncertain origin. However, the real treasure lay in a potential Viking gold bracelet, estimated at $9,400. The seller was elated at the revelation. Um, this is part of a bracelet. Okay. Um, it's, it's a copper alloy. You know, this item is probably worth $50. The complete bracelet uh, is obviously larger and more interesting. This is based on its size and certainly not a Viking spear. Uh, it's an arrowhead uh, of some sort, but it's certainly outside of my range uh, okay. of expertise. And the bracelet. The bracelet is, it appears to be Viking gold. Obviously, it would appear to be the, the star of, of, of this group of items. Auction estimates on it would be something between 
you know, 6,000 to 8,000 British pounds, which would be, and I'll, I'll leave it to you to translate. Please translate, my fine friend. Uh, um, 6,000 pounds would be right around, um, 9,400 bucks. Rick initially offered $6,000 for the gold bracelet, but after negotiation, they settled on 7250 for the entire collection. Now this right here, um, <laughs> I was thinking right around $6,000. I was thinking around $8,000. You're a hard guy to well, I, I'm not a hard guy to deal with it. You're the one who walked in here and wanted 1000 for all of it, and you're walking out of here with seventy two fifty. <laughs> so, okay, well, for the magical gold, we'll have to settle with that, buddy. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm gonna box this stuff up and I will meet you right over there at the pond counter. Okay. 7,200. I'm gone. Hit the jackpot straight to the bank. Let's get on. 1715 Spanish gold coin. Jody came to the shop holding a shiny gold coin from Lima, Peru. Rick was immediately interested in its story. Although Jody didn't know much about the coin, Rick thought it could be valuable. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Oh, pretty good. Good. I'd like to sell this gold coin if I could. Okay. Eight escudos. This is a Spanish stamp here. This is like the Royal Crest of Spain. So where did you get this? I got that from my grandfather when he died. Uh, he left a safe full of contents. Any other cool things in the safe? Not really, no. No holy grails or anything like that? No, no. nothing to my knowledge. <laughs> Do you know much about this? I don't know much about it at all. Okay. I know a little bit about the coin. I mean, it's eight escudos. Um, it was from Lima, Peru. They had, like, the worst mines in the world. This coin is in exceptional condition, and I've seen similar coins fetch thousands of dollars at auction. So if this is a real piece of Spanish treasure from the 1700s, I want it. To be sure, Rick had an expert check its authenticity. The expert confirmed it was real and connected it to a shipwreck from 1715, adding to its allure. I want to sell it. What were you looking to get out of it? Uh, I'd like to get 2000 if I could. Okay. Um, this coin is in really great shape, but this is easily counterfeited. There's a lot of fakes out there. So I'd really like someone to take a look at it, okay. if you don't mind. No. I got a buddy who knows everything there is to know about these. I have him come in, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Sounds great. That's a Lima Ada Scudo, and in this corner there's an L, that means Lima Peru Mint. Eight is the denomination, biggest gold coin the Spanish made. From everything I can see on this one, it's absolutely genuine. Okay, so what do you think this is worth? I would put a price tag of 18000 on it. Okay. Jody ended up selling the coin for a nice sum of $11,000 in cash. Okay, so the big question is, what do you want for it? Sounds like eighteen thousand to me. No, I don't. Why would we give you ten grand for it? I could, I could pack it up and go. I would, I wouldn't take anything less than eleven thousand. So eleven thousand. Eleven thousand. Okay. Got a All deal. Right. It was a win-win situation. The Pawn Stars got a valuable addition to their collection, and Jody walked away with some extra money. The coin's history and authenticity made it a fascinating find for Pawn Stars. Liberace medallion. A visitor named Kurt brought in a special piece of jewelry, a flashy Liberace medallion. This medallion filled with diamonds and American gold coins was a symbol of the entertainer's flamboyant style from the late 70s. Hey, how can I help you? I have the most important piece of jewelry by a Las Vegas icon, Liberace. That's really, really cool. Bling, bling? What? <laughs> you got some Liberace bling? Yeah. I mean, the guy was pretty amazing. My grandma loved Liberace. And I'm not gonna lie, I got some respect for the guy. I got it at an auction. Um, pretty damn cool. I know that he was the highest paid live performer in the world for a good 15 years. Even more than Elvis? More than Elvis. Supposedly the fastest piano player in the world. Uh, he's well remembered in this town. Sort of Mr. Las Vegas. I mean, they had the Liberace Museum here in town that was around forever. What really brought him over the top was just the crazy outfits, the giant pianos. Yeah. He had gigantic uh, candelabras sitting on top of the pianos. There was no part on his piano that wasn't blingy. He was the ultimate showman. He didn't like radio, but his thing was, you know, I do the audio visual, I do the little flamboyant things, jump around, hand movements, all this other stuff. You had to see him on TV or in person to get the full Liberace effect. Radio just didn't do him justice. Kurt wanted a big $25,000 for it, having bought it at an auction with all the proper documents, but Rick didn't see it the same way. He thought it was worth more like $10,000 because of the gold and diamonds, 
not just the history. He wore this every day of his life, and it was his favorite piece. This piece right here? Yeah. Here's a picture of him wearing it. That's really, really cool. And you're selling all this stuff together, the book and all the other provenance, right? Yeah. I have a couple of pictures, and I have a certificate of authenticity from the auction house, which I purchased it from. December 3rd, 2011, you bought it. Yeah. I'm looking for 25000 It's one of those things where it's really hard to come up with a number. A little over $3,000 worth of gold, and uh, you had another $3,000 worth of diamonds. I don't see 25 grand here. I just don't. I see 10. Despite negotiations, they couldn't agree. Rick couldn't justify paying so much more than he thought it was worth, even for something linked to Liberace. In the end, they couldn't strike a deal. You know, I didn't come in here asking for 100000 I just thought it was totally reasonable asking for twenty five. How much did you get it for an auction? Uh, I didn't want to disclose that. Ten grand, I think, is a fair offer. Yeah, I can't do it. Well, thanks for bringing it in, man. Okay, thank you. I was already picturing that piece in a display case with a big fat price tag. It would have looked amazing in there. But as a business owner, I can't pay double what something's worth, even if it did belong to an icon like Liberace. 2001 Super Bowl Championship Ring. In one episode, Rick shared a surprising story about his first Patriots Super Bowl ring. It stood out among the many he had dealt with. The ring originally belonged to Brock Williams, who pawned it in Vegas for $2,600. Ray came across it later among some items. Believe it or not, I have pawned hundreds of Super Bowl rings, but they always pick them up. The very first one I ever actually got to own, that's my 2001 Patriot Super Bowl ring. Brock Williams, he pawned the ring. He didn't sell it, okay? He was in Vegas, and we know what happens in Vegas. He needed cash, so I think the guy in the night shift actually offered him 10,000, but he only wanted 2,600 because it's a lot less expensive to pick it up that way. I mean, he, I'm sure he more than planned on picking it up, but then, Weird things happen in this world. What you don't see on my television show is most people just come down here to get loans. You know, I would loan them money, and then they will come back later and pay me back the money I loaned them plus some interest. We'd give people 141 days to pick up their merchandise. And after that, you know, every morning, there's a thing called the defaults. These people loans people didn't pick up. Um, they defaulted on it. It's now my property. There's envelopes I'd have to go through, and I opened one up, and I just poured it out of my desk, and it made a big clunk, and I'm going like, you got to be kidding me. The ring was impressive, 14 karat white gold with 143 diamonds, sapphires, and rubies. Rick thought he could sell it for around $100,000, reflecting on its journey. To me, it's one of the coolest Super Bowl rings there ever was. It's 14 karat white gold, I think there's 143 diamonds, and they use sapphire and rubies for the logo. I don't want to sell it because what happens is, is someone will come in from say Boston, and say, hey, he's got a Super Bowl ring in the showcase. He'll go home, tell his friends, they'll wanna come in the pawn shop and see it. One of these days, I'm gonna sell that thing when he's not around. Rick remembered how most rings found their way back to their owners, but his Patriots ring stayed with him, a special reminder of the history of his sport. It was more than just a valuable item, it held sentimental value for Rick. Realistically, a ring like that is probably worth 25. And I have sold Super Bowl rings for as much as $40,000. I put the ridiculous price of $100,000 on it which is way too much money, but if someone wants to give me that, I'll actually sell it. I think I'd sell it for probably around 60. There's a lot of guys out there I'm sure would love to have it. I mean, Dan Marino would probably love to have it. Tony Romo is probably gonna need to have it one day. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a lot easier than actually winning one, I guess. This is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching it. Make sure to comment and hit that like and subscribe button too. Hit that notification bell for more videos like this. Share this video with your family and friends. See you soon.